It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. Joining me again on the show is Connor Lee. Connor Lee is CEO of HipLead, based in San Francisco. Connor, how are you doing? Doing great, Andy. Thanks a lot for having me on. Well, hey, my pleasure. Always, always a pleasure to run into. Always seem to do at conferences and so on. So, um, for people that didn't listen, hard to believe that might not have listened to the first episode we had together, the first interview back in February, I think of of 2016. May take a second, introduce yourself again, tell us a little bit about HipLead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm uh, founder CEO of HipLead. Uh, we help companies. Um, B2B sales and marketing teams scale their outbound sales. And we do that through providing um, very, very high quality targeted lists of contacts for them. And we also have a, a uh, consulting arm that helps organizations run uh, high performing outbound email campaigns. And uh, we also have a new tool um, that allows people to um, build these very targeted self serve uh, lists. Uh, on their own, so just um, doing it from a self-serve basis. So, uh, so we're you know, recently released that, and uh, pretty excited about it. Okay, well, very cool. So, you actually sort of you'll run the email campaigns for people, though, or at least you used to, right? Yeah, exactly. So we will continue to um, we'll continue to build people you know bespoke lists that are you know of, of criteria for them that are you know difficult to find and that are very 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 tight matching you know whatever their business goals are. Um, we will also separately run outbound email campaigns for those lists. Um, but we've given people an option, which is, um, has a lower minimum commitment, lower price. Um, and it has some self-serve features that our clients have been asking for, for a while, um, that allow them to build their own, um, groups of lists. Uh, and then for all of those things, we can apply our, you know, our expertise, uh, having worked with the, a lot of sort of top SaaS companies, um, on what works and in, in helping them to scale their own outbound sales uh, email campaigns. Got it. Got it. So people can write their own copy if they want, but uh, you could apply your expertise if you have, if they want to. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. So uh, we're going to talk today about uh, an article you'd written and sort of take the conversation off that, which was you said every SaaS sales team must try email first cold calling. Now, first question is. <sighs> Why wouldn't they do that? Well, I mean, that's a good point. I think at the end of the day, a lot of teams, um, you know, will, will give their give their reps a list, and the reps will run through them. Um, oftentimes, you know, whether SDRs or AEs, a lot of times you're know, forgetting for getting a large getting through a big list of, of calls or getting through a big list of emails. Oftentimes, it can be very efficient to you know focus on one thing at a time. And I think, um, and and that's, you know, just managing the daily work is what, you know, when people end up not doing email first cold calling, that's kind of, you know, the process, um, the advent of, there's a lot of great tools out there, uh, you know, outreach and and a number of other ones that allow, um, that allow sales reps to connect together uh, a cadence of, of different steps and, and kind of manage that. And so that has allowed people to, um, you know, to, to, to make it a lot easier to do email first cold calling. So, yeah, I mean, it seems just in a general sense that, that, you know, one of the hard things about, uh, just cold calling without emailing first is, is it is extremely cold. I mean, I, you know, I'll go back to my early days in sales where I hate to say this, where email hadn't existed yet. And, but even then we always tried to send something like a mail or a letter or something to warm up cold calls. Uh, even when we were doing, you know, outbeating a territory on the street, you know, we'd always try to warm the lead up with something, so some expectation of what it is we might be talking about when we come. Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and I think it's it's there's a lot of people out there that that it, it's, it's you know, sales is hard, it's labor intensive, um, it's repetitive, um, and it's easy to fall into you know, just back into unhealthy or less productive. Um, habits pretty easily. Yeah, um, definitely, <laughs> so, <definitely. laughs> 
So, um, yeah, so one of the, you know, so we ran an experiment and, and, and basically, um, and, and started applying, you know, once we said the results of this experiment, we started applying it, um, to, you know, on our own team, um, widely, and then also started, you know, uh, recommending that other of our clients try the same thing and actually working with them on setting up campaigns that were email first cold calling. Right. So you said in, in your article that based on your research, the email first calling strategy can increase prospect to meeting rates two to three times. Uh, why do you think that's the case? Well, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's two reasons. I mean, the, the, the simplest, the, you know, the most obvious one is that you catch someone when they're, you know, so the, the email first cold calling, the idea is that you get up, you know, you have to have a method to understand ideally um, if, if an individual has opened an email um, that you have sent them. So there's a sort of a technology component. It works without it, but it works best when you have that ability. Sure. Um, and, you, and, and you talk about that later in the article and we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it works best because generally the, the, you, um, because the contacts, you know, are, are looking at your email, <laughs> right? Then they, they, they know who you are. They've received some information out of the blue. It's not totally cold per se. Um, and you know, they can probably with, with if you've emailed, you call them three minutes or less, they'll probably, it'll probably in, be in their, you know, short term and midterm memory, <laughs> kind of who you are and what you're talking about if they actually read the email. Um, so yeah, so it ends up, you know, they just are more aware of who you are. Um, and then secondly, we found, you know, basically you have a reason to open up the call and say, yeah, I sent you an email. Um, so it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a behavior that, that, you know, and people are more willing to listen and, and, and to, and to take your call simply because there was some, some context, um, that it came before the call. Yeah. And I, I guess that's the point I was really driving at is, is the two to three times was comparing, Getting a person on the phone in both instances, either without the email or with the email, and I think that was the comparison, right? So once you've got somebody on the phone, if you didn't do the email first, then your conversion rate to a meeting was going to be substantially lower than if you had emailed them first and provided some context for the call. So basically what the email does then is sort of gets past that first, what I call sort of the the cold open of a call, the first seven to nine seconds, whether you have a chance to grab somebody's attention. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You hit it, hit it right in the head. Um, yeah, it, it definitely does that. And, uh, it, it can, you know, just ha- having, you know, trained, you know, ourselves kind of just really focused on our own internal SDR work. It, it, it's funny how, um, you know, how, how, how much of a learning curve it can be for, for young SDRs or new SDRs to really getting past that first hurdle. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and depending on what you're, you know, where you're working, what market you're in, um, you know, it, it can be pretty competitive for, for, you know, to get young folks on your team even, um, or getting folks that are more experienced in your team. So, um, this is a nice strategy that works, um, and can help, you know, young SDRs get over that initial hurdle and that initial awkwardness, um, um, if they were just purely cold calling without any context. Yeah. And I would say even it's not just relegated to young SDRs. I mean, even I listen to a lot of recorded calls and and even experienced SDRs. That first zero to I said zero to nine seconds, all it does is basically serve to put the the, the buyer's defenses up, right? Even the good ones. I mean, I, I get the calls all the time. I first thing happens, the walls go up because I know it's somebody's trying to. It's a sales call. Mm-hmm. So it's I think, true. <laughs> so I said I think it almost doesn't matter how adept people are at it is sent to my way of thinking and and again based on my own experiences sending that that email first whatever that contact point is first yeah you you then have some context you, that open becomes less awkward and becomes like getting into the meat of the conversation much more quickly definitely um, yeah it absolutely does and, and it. And at least it also makes the the caller, um, you know, the sales rep just feel more comfortable themselves, I think, if you've got something to hold on to mm-hmm. in that first call. Oh, I, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, it's it's uh, it gives them a, a reason, right? Because everybody has the, especially the new ones, have some level of call reluctance. And, yeah, I think the email first actually really tamps down the call reluctance fairly substantially because yeah people then feel like yeah i'm not cold calling i'm following up on something i sent and follow up just mentally even though the the impact from the buyer's perspective is the same just that slight twist in orientation of of purpose makes a huge difference in people's willingness to do it yeah yeah absolutely and and it's 
And it, it is funny, sort of, I, and it's, it's, you can tell when, it's actually interesting listening to cold calls that I get that have been preceded by a, preceded by an email and preceded, not preceded by an email. And, you know, now that I'm kind of thinking about it, I, I'm fairly certain that all of the calls that I've taken personally myself have been preceded by an email. Um, and maybe there's one, but the, that guy was just exceptionally, uh, exceptionally good at cold calling um, and actually getting me on the phone. So, and there are very few of those people. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you find all of those people, <laughs> hire them and keep them on your team. <laughs> well, if they're that good, they're not going to stay SDR so long. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. So let's talk about the email component of it then. So, so what, let's get some specifics on what that warm up email should look like. So, it's best practices, what do you recommend? Because, you know, you send tons of these emails yourself, your company is like a subject line. What's sort of your best recommendation for people that are, are looking at putting together a pithy, pithy subject line that catches attention? Sure. Well, I'll, there are, there are two different approaches, and I'll go in and in, in the first one, which is probably the the most the simplest. The simplest is really relevancy. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, just like any outbound email campaign, the first, you know, the first within the half a second, the person wants to know, like, what, you know, how is this relevant to me? And um, you know, usually we, when we work with our clients, we we always make sure the subject line includes some sort of relevancy to to about them, or if not, the first the first line of the actual email, um, using specifics about their industry, using specifics about them, um, and or, you know, or asking engaging questions that are actually matter to them um, right off right off the bat. Um, and uh, we like to be able to basically to sort of say that look, this can bas- this can pass a Turing test more or less, right? Well, and and. You know, when, when cold emails kind of pass the, one, pass the one test, a, a, a Turing test in, in, in a way, right? Well, well, it's it's a human, not a machine. A real person is sending you oh, okay. uh, this email, not not a, not you know, not just a, a generic uh, one to many email blast. Okay, so for people who hadn't heard that term before, so reference I presume to Alan Turing. Exactly. Okay. And yeah, yeah. Who who basically um, said that the the pinnacle of of uh, of computer development would be the point where a person interacting with a computer. Um, I think over text couldn't tell if it was a real person or a computer they were actually interacting with. Okay. Yeah, I presume it wasn't over text because he was dead long before text messaging came along. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, subject line, relevance. So, keywords relevant to what they're doing. Relevant to what they're doing and, and depending on their audience, uh, what they care about. So, so for us... Outcomes. We, yeah, exactly. Outcomes. Um, and I'll use an example with, with, um, you know, with our own organization or any organization that sells to sales and marketing, um, folks is what's relevant to them is their audience, not necessarily their industry as much that, that can. So it depends on the role of the, of the individual you're trying to contact mm-hmm. within the organization. So if you're selling to sales and marketing, it can often be about who they're trying to reach. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, other, other roles have, have different things that they, that are important to them that they care about. Um, so you have to really, you know, what we usually do is we create a matrix that effectively says, okay, well, let's look at the total audiences that you're selling to. And we create a matrix based on the industries of those audiences. Um, and we have, um, you know, why this industry should care about this thing. Um, usually try to create some content that's relevant to them or, or put that in the email. And then the second piece we have is a, is a contact role to company size matrix. So you can look at organizational size and role. And for each, you know, depending on you know, what they're reaching out to, who, who, how many different groups the email campaign is going to, we'll put together a matrix that talks about here is the pain points and, and, and uh, that are that are addressed this type of role at this organizational size. Um, and then, you know, we use that in the copy um, pretty early on. Got it. Okay. And so one of the big issues, obviously, with a lot of email these days is even though there's... Uh, a lot of hype from a lot of tools saying, you know, this is uh, this is a tool that we can use to really personalize this mass email we're sending. Um, how do you, you know, construct something that that you know, if you're sending in limited quantity still feels personalized? Besides, you know, mail merge and hey, here's your first name. Uh, how do you do that? How do you overcome that sort of yeah? You know, I've got a filter. I can sort of not 100 percent reliability, but you know, ninety percent reliability. Know what's what's mass versus what is personal. 
Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it takes a little bit of work. Um, working with when we when we're doing this working with our clients, it's it's always a little bit of a back and forth to understand um, their product and how their product impacts their audience, and 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 that's something you really can't get away with, you know, not doing. Um, you really have to understand, you know, what are the different pain points that 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 apply to each of these audiences. And, and it can be hard, um, you know, and working, you know, if you're at an early stage organization, uh, it can be hard to, to nail those down. You basically have to spend, you know, your sales cycle sort of doing that. Um, but at later stage organizations, uh, they tend to have a little better, better idea. Um, and, and kind of getting back to kind of my layout of the matrix, what we do is we'll, we'll break down um, the audiences into pretty granular groups, um, our clients' audiences. And, and, you know, do and spend the time to make sure that that pain point really hits um, that group of contacts. Um, and now it's not going to resonate with absolutely everybody, um, but it's going to be relevant enough that they're going to care and respond at, at a, you know, predictable, dependable rate. Mm-hmm. Um, it used to be, you know, three, four or five years ago, you could, you know, you'd send out blasts of emails and, and you would get a decent response rate, um, you know, by, by, you know, being mysterious, um, and not giving them a lot of information that would, you know, you know spark any conversation. Uh, I think that, that period's more or less passed. And now you really have to do the work to, to divide up the audiences and understand those audiences' pain points and test those pain points um, to see if that resonates. Well, I think you raise a really key point, is, and you talk about this in other articles you've written, is just the absolute necessity of A-B testing any emails that you send out. Yeah, it's... it's uh, it's funny, you know, when, when people, um, don't AB test, um, they oftentimes, a lot of our clients will, will um, ha- have run campaigns and, and, you know, and, and, uh, and once we really turn on the AB testing and, and show them the progress that they're, they're really shocked at, at, at the results, um, you know, that, that actually come through it. I mean, let's say, you know, uh, there's another article we I'd written, one of them you're probably referencing, um, when we looked at, um, you know, tests that we had run and, and we took four different copies and we, we basically said, okay, if we ran this copy, this copy is the four copies we wrote and didn't AB test them. If you ran them all together at once, um, uh, the same number of emails for each one, or you just randomly chose each one, what would be, what would be the, the response rate? Um, and just by running, you know, two different comparisons, um, between those copies, it, it, it increased it from a 2% interested to a 9% interested on that, on those random subject lines. So it can make a huge, huge difference. Yeah. And then it, you know, there's a cumulative effect of doing that, right? <laughs> so, you know, if you're continually doing AB testing and branching toward the positive side, as opposed to if you're not doing it, you could be off on a path that you're, there's no recovery from. Totally. Absolutely. Um, and, and also the simple fact with the people that are writing the emails, if they're, if they're cognizant enough about AB testing, about the need to do that, they're going to learn things um, themselves and they're going to understand things about their audience that, that, you know, maybe wasn't as apparent to them before AB, AB testing. So, you know, you need to take that and that what you learn about your audience applies to everything you do going forward. Um, well, raise an interesting point is, you know, so if companies are going to invest in, you know, being aggressive about emailing prior to cold calling and so on is, yeah, it's, it's, to me, this is not a throwaway effort. You know, it's not a matter of saying, yeah, if we get that in front of the person, that's good enough. It, it needs to be good copy. It, you know, as you talk about the points of relevance, it needs to be succinct, needs to speak to their needs. And I think that's a problem I see a lot is, you know, the quality of the email message you get is, is not very good. So do people just need to hire, break down, hire copywriters? I mean, if they really want to look at this from a cost effectiveness standpoint, you know, we're going to spend a lot of money investing, build our SDR team, make a bunch of cold calls. We're going to proceed with good emails, but if the emails are crap, then they're sort of wasting the effort. Yeah, I mean, you know, hiring copywriters is definitely is definitely a good way to go. Um, it, you know, at least uh, I'd say at, at, if you're using the same copy in your outbound email campaigns that you were using a year or a year and a half ago. Uh, you should probably change things up and shake things up a little bit, unless, unless you're in a space that is not competitive at all and has a huge audience that hasn't heard of <laughs> yeah. what you're let's, doing. Let's see, a huge, <laughs> huge audience, not competitive. Yeah, I don't think those exist. Yeah, 
Um, but you know, and I, I, we, we try to do ourselves internally and, and, you know, you know, for our own campaigns is at least once a quarter, um, kind of try to rewrite the playbook and test, test the, that against the, the old playbook. Um, and, and use, use things that are going on. So we're constantly evolving. For our clients, we, you know, we're doing it every week, every other week. Um, we're, we're testing, you know, min- making either minor or sometimes pretty large shifts, um, depending on, on what our clients are looking for. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's like any kind of marketing collateral. It gets stale. Um, you know, the, the, the tips and tricks that worked one year ago are, are a decrease. There, there's, there's a certain half-life to everything um, when it comes to sales and marketing. Uh, at least from a, from a from a tactical perspective. Well, certainly, certainly marketing way more so than sales. But yeah, they, it's true. Uh, though interesting, you know, <laughs> you ask you ask people what some of their favorite sales books are that have been most influential, successful people in sales these days, and they'll still reference books like you know Dale Carnegie that was written you know How to Win Friends and Influence People it was written in the 1930s. So certain certain things about human nature don't change, but true. Uh, <laughs> What what sort of segue? I was going to give you a little bit of a hard time about something you said in in the article, oh, which, yeah. which was you said twenty years ago selling was simple. No, what what exactly did you mean by that? Okay, I, I maybe and I and I, I understand kind of uh, where the, the the bone picking is going on on this, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't. But let's 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 go. Well, okay, so I, I guess what I was saying, and I'm trying the point I was trying to get to is that. Is that there's a lot of stuff right now being thrown at salespeople. There's there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of um, channels. Um, you know, there's you know, there's in person communication there's channels, right? Yeah, yeah, and it can be a lot to balance. Um, it, it, and and just you know, sales is about sales is about prioritization. Um, being successful at sales is really a, a, a key skill is is being able to prioritize. Um, and, you know, and not fall up on things that are lower priority than other things are higher priority. And when you just add more channels and you add, um, more things, um, you know, getting the fundamentals done can often be overlooked. You know, getting the fundamentals well can be overlooked. Um, and because it's easy to, it, it, it's, you have to learn each one of these different tools. Um, you have to, um, become proficient at it and then you have to look for trends across all of them. And I think, um, you yeah, that, that, that's, 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 I guess what I was getting to. It was <laughs> maybe not simpler, but, um, uh, there were just, less, probably less distractions. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would say that's the case for sure. Right. I mean, uh-huh. yeah, fewer distractions. 20 years ago, people weren't walking around with iPhones in their pockets, um, or even Blackberries necessarily for that matter. I mean, they were just beginning to come out, um, yeah, no, it's just sort of funny. I'd had a conversation with another guest recently. We've been talking about this, and and in the sort of same topic came up about you know people somehow imagine that you know in the olden days things were that much easier. Da, 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 da. And I was I was harking back to my days. You know, and my first uh, well, when I first sold, and when I first was managing a team of salespeople in the East Bay area of, of the Bay Area. And, uh, you know, I had, I had salespeople that were held up at gunpoint, I had people taking, oh, wow. sh- taking shots at their car. I mean, things that don't happen when you're in inside sales. So, um, <laughs> that's true. And, and there were actually physical gatekeepers. So that's the thing that's, that's really sort of interesting. I think that, you know, the nice thing about, about inside sales to a certain degree, yeah, rejection is never easy, but, um, it's way different. You're actually meeting and face to face with a person that's just telling you, get out of here. <laughs> mm, totally. and, how, and how do you get around that? Because that was your job. You know, you're, so if we we're out making, you know, cold calling 50, 50 calls a day, knocking on doors, uh, it's, it was different. I wouldn't say it was easier or harder, but it was just different. But I just I had to give you a hard time about that. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> and rightly so. But also I, th- I think that, that to a certain degree, um, you know, sort of begs sort of the conversation is without, going too far down a path, but as if a digression is that, yeah, we, that's something we have to separate selling from prospecting. Cause really what we're talking about today is prospecting. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, it's, it's an open argument whether you really consider that selling. Yeah. We, we tend to put that role into a sales function, but it's lead generation. It could just as easily be in marketing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a, that's a very good point. It's sort of, it's sort of funny how, you know, obviously, you know, 
and there's a whole discussion of marketing and sales sort of merging and, and where the one starts and one ends. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is a good point. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to think that the point at which, um, marketing ends and sales starts or when really what prospecting starts and, and prospecting ends and sales starts is really, um, yeah, I guess, I guess most people would say it's a, the conversion of the opportunity, but that's just a, t- a tag. Um, that's just something you apply to it. But at some point it's, you know, is their interest, has their interest been sparked, um, to some degree, um, I think still re- needs to be in the realm of prospecting. Um, I, I think checking boxes without, you know, really demonstrating interest it is, is I think, and that's why I consider prospecting in sales because I think that when prospecting is done correctly, um, you are sparking their interest, not only qualifying them, but moving them to that next point. Um, so I guess, I guess that's kind of where, where I come from on that, on that, on that angle, at least on that piece. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to come down where it's, you know, terminology changes, but you know, when you have a sales qualified lead, Mm -hmm. then sales starts. Mm-hmm. You know that first substantive conversation. That's sales. Uh, prior to that, it's sort of, to me, it's sort of awareness building and interest generation, lead generation. But um, it doesn't really matter in the long term. But uh, just a little side conversation there. Um, all right. So let's talk about some of the tactics. Back to emailing first. Is, sure. is you talked about um, you know doing email blasts, and what I thought was really interesting is because again, there's you know a fair amount of divergence of opinion about this is you know you advocate look if you get any replies from these outbound emails you treat them like inbound leads and you call them as quickly as you can you said five minutes which would be ideally would be fantastic you know huge believer in that but on the other hand yeah i talked to a company just a couple days ago and they're saying oh yeah we've got we have way too many leads to do that um and replies to campaigns and so on so mm-hmm. yeah where do you sort of come down? i know you come down doing it faster what if people say well we just get too many replies from this. We can't do it all that quickly. Yeah. I mean, to, to a certain degree, um, you know, if, well, I guess I come from an, you know, a perspective where, um, you know, again, a lot of our clients are, are selling, you know, really like, like ACV products of, you know, over five, almost always over 10, you know, definitely over five and oftentimes over 10,000. Um, you know, not half a million usually as much, but but over ten thousand. Um, ten thousand for sure as a, uh, a monthly recurring number. Oh, you know, just average contract value. Oh, um, okay. So, ACV. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so and it's very at, very transactional. Yeah. Well, yeah, relatively transactional. I mean, yeah. but at a certain point, like, I guess, I guess on our campaigns that we run for people, if you're, we measure interested rates. Um, it, it's one of the things that kind of the things that, that, that we do for our clients. So we actually go in and tag, um, you know, whether an email is interested, neutral, not interested, you know, or sort of, or like take me off your list, um, and no reply. And so, um, we tend to prioritize calling to the interested and, 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 and we, t- we will prioritize calling to the interested and the neutrals before the not interested. Um, and interested indicated by opening an email or opening and replying and replying. Yeah. Replying okay. ideally first and then, and then actually opening. But, um, so I guess, you know, you have to pick and choose your battles. So it depends on, you know, how big a list you're emailing, how many of them are, are opening them, uh, in general, how targeted, I suppose this the email first calling works when you have a very targeted list uh, to begin with. Yeah, and that you know, um, and that you're you know it's um, yeah you've done the work to identify the personas, the stakeholders, the people you need to reach out to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you also then say, hey, you know, call everybody that replies. Which I I, th- I think I guess to me I agree a hundred percent. But yeah. again, you'll find some number of people would say horrified by that prospect because. <laughs> Yeah, they're in no way qualified, blah, 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 blah. True, true. Um, you know, and, and, and I guess that comes back to also that, that, you know, we try to data qualify as much as we can. Um, and if we can't data qualify them, um, we try as much as we can to qu- their response qualifies them. So asking a question that in that response, it will make sure they're qualified or not. And if they're not, if they're not qualified, obviously, wouldn't call them back wouldn't give them a call. Um, well, the thing is you'd, you'd use 
every reply, every you had in, in all caps. So even if somebody calls and says we're not interested, <laughs> call them? If, if they're qualified, um, if, if they're a qualified lead, um, I, I think it would be – I mean, it depends on, on their level of interest. So if they're saying, you know, don't call me, remove me from your list. Yeah, no. obviously, right. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we, we've we done it, one, as, as not only as, as an exercise for our SDRs to, to sort of just have more conversations with people, um, but I think that, you know, most of the time, you're not going to get a hold of them anyways, <laughs> right? So as, as you know, in cold calling and in general, right? Yeah. You know, it's yeah, three quarters go to email, right? Connect, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, so or voicemail, it, I said email, but voicemail. Yeah. yeah. Voicemail. <laughs> so, you know, we haven't found that we haven't found that it's been that not much negative has, has come out of, of calling the not interested. So we haven't gotten a lot of people that are angry. Um, we have gotten a number of people to, con- to convert. Um, and the reason why is because people instinctively say not interested without reading an email. Um, oftentimes they, uh, there's a lot of people that fall into that category and it, and when you're following up with, when, you know, when the sales team is call, following up with, with leads that are, um, that have responded as, as, as a little bit negative, um, you know, or not interested, we usually like to understand why they weren't interested. And that's usually the, you know, the, the way that we've trained our team and, and we and our clients oftentimes do. Um, but so you give them a call and say, Hey, totally understand. Don't want to hear from me. I'm just curious, you know, what was the reason why? And just so I can make sure we don't, we, we don't bother you again if it's not relevant okay. for you. Yeah. That's so. a good tactic. Uh, mm-hmm. so last one tactic you talked about sort of the advanced, which is, you know, obviously you're using email tracker and you call everybody who opens. Yeah. Um, and, and again, this is, this is, you know, one that's, really should be used only when the list is, 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 uh, very targeted, very targeted. Yeah. Right. Um, or else you just, you know, it's not a great use of your, your team's time. Um, but yeah, and, and we try to call within like 30 seconds. Um, and so what you need to do of them opening now, and what needs to happen is you have to, um, slow the email cadence out. So you're not sending, you know, a thousand emails at once, you know, you just send one every couple of minutes. Um, first, and it needs to not be a huge list that you're blasting out, you know, right. maybe 50 every morning or, you know, through right. over a bit of time. Um, and obviously you're not going to call every single person that opens it within 30 seconds or five minutes. Um, but, um, but you can use that as a, you know, and it, you do know when they open it, especially if the system you're using, um, like some of the tech that we have tells you what type of device they're on. Mm-hmm. Um, and it tells you the number of times they've opened it. Right. Um, and so, you know, you know, at that point it's that they're looking at your email that you sent them, maybe they've shared it with someone else that they're on their mobile phone or on their computer. Um, and you can use that to, to really inform your conversation. Now, I See, wouldn't, I, and I would, <laughs> yeah, I would, I, my thought on that, and this is, I sort of do it on emails, emails that I sent out is, is I do it on the second open mm-hmm. because then I know they're going back, they're looking at it again. And then it, it really sort of freaks the customer out because they're saying, you know, I was just thinking about you. <laughs> and it's like, oh, really? Well, great minds think alike. I mean, this is... You know, and and <laughs> even people you think would know better and, and know that you're tracking when they open or not, um, they still have that same sort of same reaction. So I think it's a... To me, I think doing it on the second open, a very strong way to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, of all these recommendations at the end of the day, um, you know, don't change your, you know, if, if there are limitations of your sales process, we're not advocating people that change their sales process no. around completely. Um, but it, it's worth trying, you know, it's worth okay. trying to see if this works for, works for you. All right. Um, yeah. Um, so kind of last segment of the show, I've got some standard questions. I ask all my guests, you've answered some of these before, so I've got some new ones for you. Um, so first one is, is, um, in your opinion, is it easier to teach, a technical non-sales person how to sell or teach a salesperson how to sell a technical product? Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd say the latter. Um, it, and it depends of course on the complexity of your product. And right. I actually, I think it's a really big, you know, a, a major component is actually how technical. So if you're selling, if you're selling to, you know, to people with PhDs and, you know, in fields where it requires 10 years of, of, uh, 
of specialization to get where they are. Um, it, it highly, highly specialized, then it's going to be a little bit of a learning process. I, I think that um, I think that for most sales positions are not that you know even on the technical side of things are not that technical. Mm-hmm. I think I, I would tend to try to get smart um, utility salespeople um, that can you know. They can, you know, take be given the cliff notes <laughs> on this specific uh, right. target and go with it. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So, uh, what's one great work of literature that you think every salesperson should read? Ah, oh, man, every salesperson should read. Well, I'll I'll answer this with every. I'd say every sales manager or sit or or founder that's in the you know, CEO of founding role, um, should definitely read my, one of my favorite recent books was the, was, uh, Ben Horowitz's book, the hard thing about, um, hard things. Uh, I thought it was an awesome book. I may have actually given you that book last time, um, as well. Um, but I, I think that's a just amazing book in terms of, um, you know, how, how to, how to think about selling, how to think about your organization. Um, even if it's not about selling, there's a lot of things that, that he talks about in that book that are really applicable to right. setting up an organization for success. And, and obviously, he's you know, a SaaS-oriented guy. Um, so there's always a major sales components um, in what, he, what he's done and what he continues to do. Okay. okay. Well, I need to learn I need how to, to ask that question better because I said the great literary book. And that wouldn't necessarily qualify oh, literary. as a literary book. But that's okay. We'll, we'll oh, interesting. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> so if, if you could change one thing about your business self, what would it be? I'm thinking about my business self. Well, I would, um, I think well, I'd make more of me, um, <laughs> obviously, but, um, you know, I, I think one thing that I, I could probably do is, was to spend more time, um, to spend more time, uh, doing things that are, that are less work related. Um, so I, I think, you know, obviously reading more would be, um, those Reading great works of literature, for instance. Great works of literature, for instance. Yeah. All right, perfect. There you go. Excellent. All right, last question for you. Do you have like a favorite quote or words of wisdom that you live by? And if so, what is it? Well, let's think here. So I've got, um, you know, there is a quote, and uh, I, ha- I usually keep it on my desk. I don't see it right in front of me. Oh, here it is. And it's uh, it's, a, it's a little, it's a poet. This guy, Rainier Maria Rilke. Um, yeah. Yes. And uh, yeah, he has a quote, all that is hurrying soon will be over with. Only what lasts can bring us to the truth. So I like that quote a lot. All right. So say it, say it again more slowly. Only that is hurrying will soon be over with. Only what lasts can bring us to the truth. Oh, like it. All right. Very nice. <laughs> well, good, Connor. I appreciate it. A good way to end the interview. So tell people how they can get in contact with you. Sure. Um, you can go to hiplead.com. Um, that's probably the easiest. Um, and, and, uh, and, and either request a sample or, or, uh, or uh, email us there. We also have our phone number on the site um, as well. But uh, visit us at hiplead.com. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you again. And remember, friends, thank you for spending time with me today. Make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. And one easy way to do that, take a minute, subscribe to this podcast, Accelerate. That way you won't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Connor Lee, who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining me. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com. 